Tonight, debating the debate. Two rounds of Democratic infighting now in the books. We'll review the week's debates, check the stage here for the next round in September, and ask, did anyone see a president or even a nominee on the stage in Detroit? Then, the killing of Eric Garner by a New York cop five years ago found its way into last night's debate. We'll update the case, fact check the claims made by Mayor de Blasio, and discuss what could happen now. And later, all this focus on the election, but no one working to protect those elections. We'll talk to an expert in search of solutions. Good evening and welcome to RFL. I'm Richard French and thanks for tuning in this Thursday night. Ever since November 8th, 2016, Democrats, they've been waiting for a candidate to emerge to take on, yes, Donald Trump. There's been all kinds of anticipation, some big victories in the midterm elections, but after last night's second Democratic debate, a lot of Dems, they're still waiting. Night two for the Democrats was combative as well as confrontational, with Joe Biden under constant attack from all sides, and Kamala Harris, she feeling the heat as well. General consensus tonight seems to be no one on the stage really shined. Well, this evening, we've got analysis of the debates and the state of the race, plus we're going to take a look ahead to the third debates that are scheduled for next month in September. But first, a look back at last night's clash in Detroit. Kicking off his rematch with Senator Kamala Harris, Joe Biden, he had a simple request. Go easy on me, kid. <laughs> but Harris made it clear she has no plans of easing up, hammering Biden on health care. Your plan does not cover everyone in America by your staff's and your own definition. You do nothing to hold the insurance companies to, to task for what they have been doing to American families. Biden fired back, saying, Harris's plan will cost too much and take too long to implement. This idea is a bunch of malarkey, what we're talking about here. I don't know what math you do learning with California, but I tell you, that's a lot of money, and there will be a deductible. After a strong performance in the first debate, Harris was also forced to play defense. Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard slamming Harris's record as a prosecutor. In the case of those who are on death row, innocent people. You actually blocked evidence from being revealed that would have freed them until you were forced to do so. There is no excuse for that. And the people who suffered under your reign as prosecutor, oh, you owe them an apology. My entire career, I have been opposed, personally opposed to the death penalty, and that has never changed. And I dare anybody who is in a position to make that decision, to face the people I have faced to say I will not seek the death penalty. But it, but it was Biden's record that dominated the night. Under relentless assault, President Obama's former housing secretary, Julian Castro, hitting the former vice president on the high rate of deportations under the Obama administration. Mr. Vice President, it looks like one of us has learned the lessons of the past and one of us hasn't. Well, what we need you. are politicians that actually up. have some guts on this issue. I have guts enough to say his plan doesn't make sense. New York Mayor Bill de Blasio, of all people, piling on. If you're debating Donald Trump, he's not going to let you off the hook. So did you say those deportations were a good idea? Or did you go to the president and say, this is a mistake, we shouldn't do it? Which one? I was vice president. I am not the president. I keep my recommendation in private. On criminal justice reform, Senator Cory Booker and Biden going head to head. If you want to compare records, and frankly, I'm shocked that you do, uh, I am happy to do that. There was nothing done for the entire eight years he was mayor. There was nothing done to deal with the police department that was corrupt. There's a saying in my community, you're dipping into the Kool-Aid and you don't even know the flavor. Uh, you, need to, you need to come to the city of Newark and see the reforms that we put in place. <laughs> the candidates spent more time attacking each other than the president, but Senator Kirsten Gillibrand getting a laugh with a shot at Trump. The first thing that I'm gonna do when I'm president is I'm gonna Clorox the Oval Office. <laughs> and by the end of the night, Biden was brushing off the attacks. Well, <laughs> I love your affection for me. You spent a lot of time with me. <laughs> So what should Democrats make out of what they saw these past two nights in Detroit? Am I the only one maybe also underwhelmed by Biden's performance to this point? And did the debates give Donald Trump reason to maybe think his election prospects are better than they were a couple weeks ago? For answers and analysis, let's turn now to William Saladin. He writes about politics for Slate. Will, thanks for a few minutes. Thanks, Richard. Well, first, uh, let's start off um, with Biden right off the top. Uh, I, certainly, he did better uh, than the first debate. I don't know what that says, except 
it was, at least for me, a little underwhelming. What was your takeaway from the VP's performance? Well, he did better than he did in the first debate, which wasn't saying much. I mean, basically, he, he struck back, right? The first debate, he was surprised to be hit hard by Kamala Harris. And in this debate, he came prepared. He kind of sandbagged her, pretending, you know, don't come, don't uh, go easy on me, kid. And then uh, he pretty much clocked her, um, went after her record. So I think he uh, went, went on the offensive, and I think it helped him. To that end, I was surprised by the amount of relitigation, if you will, over the Obama years, um, in that, um, you know, nobody uh, was willing to give um, you know, partial credit, let's say, for the ACA. Uh, to that end, I was a little surprised. Forecast, even if you go from a clown car of 20 to 10, by the time we have the next uh, spate of debates in September, how far to the left is the party right now? And you almost have to be an apologist to defend the Affordable Care Act um, compared to what the Republicans want. Yeah, that's that's quite the index of how far the party has drifted. I, when I say the party, I don't mean the actual party, like the rank and file of the party. They're actually fairly moderate by and large. But the candidates are feeling the pressure. This happens in every presidential primary. They're feeling the pressure of the wing, in this case, the left wing, which has got the money, it's got the activists, it's got the energy. And so they're playing to that audience, not to the Democratic electorate as a whole. And the rejection of Obama or the criticism of Obama is part of that. I mean, it got to the point where last night we had um, you know, Julian Castro, who was in the Obama administration as HUD secretary, criticizing Jay Johnson, who was the DHS secretary, the Homeland Security secretary, as some kind of a Republican sellout for taking Obama's position on immigration. Hey, I, I was about to bring that up. I'm, I'm glad you did. I'm going to talk about uh, convenient amnesia. But to that point, we know of the survivors, you're going to have Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. They'll be either two and three or somewhere around there in the polling in all likelihood. To that point, this progressive argument um, and almost mandate that people move to the left, plus now you've got a majority of folks in the House that are supportive of an impeachment inquiry. I don't think this is going away anytime soon. Do you agree, Will, that they're going to have to tack left, including Biden here, even though, as you say, the general elector is far more to the center than the folks we saw on the stage last night? But I don't see that he has a choice. Yeah, he's going to have to make a gesture to those people. Uh, I think Biden could do a lot for himself by being a little bit more apologetic, for example, about his record in the 1970s just to the extent of saying, look, it was a different time. And to Biden's credit, he's now saying this. It was a different time. I had to deal with different political realities. Uh, we're now in a more what, what you might call woke environment. And that creates pressure on Biden from the left, but it also eases up on him. He doesn't have to worry about uh, the right wing as he did as a senator from Delaware. So he can afford to say, look, I, I would do things a little differently now. I had that crime bill, but now I recognize a lot of people were put in jail for too long and it didn't make any sense and we need more rehabilitation. And I think that's what he's doing. Maybe this is a little naive of me, uh, but every single poll of the registered Democrats when asked the number one issue it is, it's to beat Trump. Um, and at the end of the day, I think they'd vote for an iguana if it wasn't Trump here to be the nominee. To that end, are these guys going to tone it down a little bit? Or, as is always the case, political survival and self-survival comes first. And as a result here, uh, they're going to throw haymakers for every debate from now until uh, they got a nominee. Uh, the only point I bring this up this time around is there is such antipathy for the sitting president and the person they're going to go up against the general. I get the sense the Democrat electorate doesn't want a bloody and bruised nominee come that general. Yeah, and I, I probably, if you look at polling, you can see that a lot of the support for Joe Biden, which has stayed more constant than a lot of pundits expected, a lot of pundits expected him to collapse, and it hasn't happened. Part of the reason is what you're suggesting. There are a lot of Democrats who are like, you know, I basically trust Joe Biden. I don't want to screw this up. Right now I'm with him because I think he can win. So I think he's going to ride that as long as possible. But to your point about dislike of Trump, that is such a powerful force that I would argue to you that Democrats are less at risk than they would be in a normal election from going at each other. They can pound each other all day from now until, uh, until the nomination, until the convention. And still, so many people out there are just determined to vote against Donald Trump, and they will not be affected by a little bit of haymaker throwing between Harris and Biden and Warren and those folks right now. At the risk of uh, not being genteel enough, 
Does Biden come across as too old to you? Yeah, he, he is. He does. Um, I, I can say this as a middle aged guy. I mean, he, you start to lose something. And you can, if you watch Joe Biden over the years, you will see that he has lost something. So has Bernie Sanders. And, you know, for God's sake, so has Donald Trump. All of these people, and Nancy Pelosi for that matter, as they age, they are losing cognitive power. You can see Biden. Uh, missing lines. You can see him, you know, screwing up his text number. Um, this just happens with age. He can still do the job, I think, but it's going to hurt him as a candidate. He's going to look a little bit incoherent. For anyone who thinks we've seen the worst, um, I, I say you need a reality check in that here we are just now in August. We've got well over a year until the general. The president, not just motivated by any absence uh, of any line that he won't cross, is even more motivated than just to keep his job. I know you know this, but the public needs to be remembered. There's a statute of limitations for a whole host of investigations that if he is a private citizen in 2020, um, those statutes of limitations do not expire. A lot of uh, possible exposure for him may go away if he can last in office till 2024. He has all the motivations in the world to do anything and everything to keep his job. Do you believe that as ugly as we've seen it, and I believe it will only get worse between now and November, would Democrats be advised to go after the daily catnip and just react to whatever the president says? Or are they better off actually talking policies and how they make the country better? I think the Democrats are better off talking policies. And that is because most people out there know what Donald Trump is. They've already made that decision. There is intense dislike for him. There has been for the last three or four years. People voted for him because they didn't like Hillary Clinton, and that was the that was the difference in that election. So Democrats really don't need to say that part of the message. What Democrats need to do is reassure the country that they're not going to wreck the economy and stuff like that. And they also need to say, look, you've got some serious issues you want dealt with. You don't have good enough health coverage. We're going to try to deal with that. A couple of basic bread and butter issues is all the Democrats need, and they can let Donald Trump sell himself as the guy you want to vote against. Good stuff, Will. I appreciate a few minutes as always. Thank you so much. Thank you, Richard.